think it's recording. I still don't quite understand. Yeah, it says this uh, it says it up here on mine. Um, well, and it, I would have to maybe explain this God ordained guest here at the bottom if people see that because I wouldn't want people to think I'm kind of an a hole here. I I think it says Jared Bias because that's what I named you. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> but you can if you want. Go for it. No, no, I'm good. You can you can explain it later <laughs> if anybody asks. If, if honestly, the only people that'll understand that will be the people that have been paying attention. So really, they're going to have to earn it. Yeah, I agree. Gonna I'm, have to earn. I'm it. good. <laughs> so, either way, here we go. Jared, welcome back to the show, man. I think you're the only person that's been here as many times as you've been here. Maybe I not. consider that. I consider that an honor. I really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. No. Um. And I've told you this before. Um. A lot of the reason I still do this show is because you said yes the very first time when I literally called you at your office. Yep probably inappropriately, but whatever. Um, that's a fun story I'll, I'll write in a book one day in, in a nice sarcastic way. Um, so it's been last fall, I think we talked. Um, we actually talked a bit about truth then. Um, yeah, but, yeah, that's but, true. But um, I haven't, I'm sure you've seen, so I've been transcribing the episodes. I actually haven't made it to yours yet. So I'm curious how much they'll correlate, but we'll find out um, as, as, I, as I get there. Is it's been a minute? But... Um, yeah. So what's been new? Like six, eight months, 10 months since we last talked, at least this way. What's been new? Um, just this, uh, this whole book coming out. Um, so been having a lot more conversations around that, which it, you know, turned out to be a lot more about love and, and some about truth. And I think that's important. Um, but yeah, yeah. I've been thinking a lot more about, about love and how that complicates a lot of things. So it does complicate a lot of things. I actually quoted your book to somebody tonight and I didn't tell them that it was you. So I think that's technically plagiarism. Yeah, I think it, so. It works, <laughs> it works really well. Well, to be clear, though, I'll I, send quoted, you an invoice. I, no I quoted where you quoted Leviticus um, oh, as, okay. as Jesus is redoing the, you know, love God, you know. Mm -hmm. So yep, yep. I, I guess technically I quoted the way that you quoted the Bible. So okay. it should yeah. be free. So maybe I plagiarized. <laughs> I guess it's open. It's, it's, it's past the copyright. So um, what's the deal with the book? Why does love matter more? What are you getting at? And then I don't ask any of the questions that the publishers send because I just don't like those. So we'll fair enough. There. That's good. Because if everyone <laughs> did, then I'd just be answering the same like nine questions. Apparently, How many people do? I, I don't know. I don't know what the questions were. So. Oh, I'll have to I find them and send them to, to you. Yeah, I didn't get to see. You can give me the, you know, I don't know if I'm supposed to have them, but. <laughs> do, you, do you, I can give them to you. Doesn't matter. Um, so why does love matter more? Well, I mean, it's really, um, love matters more is really a nod to my upbringing where truth was what mattered the most. Like defending the truth of our beliefs. And we would say truth of the gospel, but as you can tell, I'm kind of allergic to even saying that. But like the truth of our beliefs was what mattered most. And we, we gave a nod to love. I think we would, I mean, the more I talk about it, I assume I heard that love was really important, but it was always translated in this like, but the most loving thing we can do is give people the hard truth that their behavior is going to lead to their downfall yeah. and they're going to end up in hell forever. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's really what the title is is leaning toward is love matters more really hinging on this verse. I mean, I, I kind of became obsessed with this verse uh, of Paul's speaking the truth in love and just because it was used as a weapon. I, I, I don't remember a single time growing up when that phrase wasn't used in the context of I'm going to say something to you that's probably going to offend you. But as long as I use this verse mm -hmm. in that context, I get like a get out of jail free card. Yeah. Say whatever you want. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the same type of thing is bless her heart. And now I can say whatever I want to say. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause, cause bless her heart. Mm -hmm. So a couple of just quick sarcastic things. Cause I need to get the puns out of the way. Um, at the beginning of chapter one, you have the sinner's prayer. Like you talk about the sinner's prayer book and it might even be before chapter one, but it's trademarked. I was unaware that the sinner's prayer is trademarked. And that's when you know that you read the book, when you realize those little things there. That's so right. is it trademarked? Is that No, a no, that's just me being sarcastic. It's like this like thing, it's like a product now. Well, but then when I kept seeing trademarks and copyright, I literally kept Googling things over and over and over again. Like I, I think um, there's a part where you talk about the 76ers uh, and the process. And I was like, yeah, is this straight? I'm like, oh, that is a thing. So then, yeah, that I is mean, true. That's yeah, true. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I want to talk about, and I never really thought about it this way. Um, it's, it's literally in your first chapter and I'm going to say the word wrong. It's um, umvelt, 
Um, the umwelt, um, yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how do you say it? Say it again. Umwelt. Yeah. I was I was close. So it's it's more like a D at the end, not a T. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, what is that um, for those that have not had the privilege of, of getting a hold of the book? Yeah. So it's it's really what it is is it's a, an analogy to help us understand our limited access to truth or to reality, and it's just this idea that uh, scientists came up with you know, ethnologist or ethology, I forget what it is. Now you got me questioning it. I always want to say ethnologist, and then I know that's actually not true. And I can't get it wrong here. Because um, that will make me look just you know really what? I'll, bad. I'll find it. I know yeah. it's page 26. Yeah, it's ethologist. Yeah, ethologist. <laughs> okay. um, ethnologist is ethnicities. Ethologist is something completely different. Anyway, it may be even ethologist. You know, one thing, this is a side, getting sidetracked here, but there's a lot of things we did. Uh, I had to do the, the audiobook version of this. Mm -hmm. And Pete and I just recorded the audiobook version of Genesis for Normal People. And I realized like how much I read and how little I, I don't know how to pronounce words because I never actually hear them <laughs> used until I have to say them out loud. And I'm like, oh, wait, I have no idea how this actually is pronounced. I've probably words like that anyway. Times. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. So ethologist, ethologist, something like that. Um, but basically it's, it's with understanding that every organism experiences the world in its own way. So there are animals that hear high pitched frequencies and there are animals that hear low pitch frequencies. And so they're going to experience sounds and, and the world in a different way. And so if you take kind of all the things that they can experience the world because of their high pitched uh, ability to hear, or because of, you know, they hear through echolocation or other senses, how they experience the world is called their umwelt, which Again, the German word for world is Welt. So it's kind of their world. And it's helpful to understand when we translate that to us that we all have our own Umwelt. We, we have our own experiences. We have our own senses. And they're slightly different than other people. And therefore, we're going to experience the world in a different way. And that's mm -hmm. kind of the idea of the Umwelt. Yeah. Yeah. And then you, you piggyback that off and you go into different, three different types of truth. And to be honest, I'm only going to remember two. There's like the logic baked truth, which you referenced the Enneagram. I haven't referenced it in a while, but since you said you were repping the eight or probably supporting eight, something like that yep. as a five logic baked truth is my, is my, mm, it's yeah, my jam. That's right. Uh, and then wisdom baked truth, which I often lack the ability to communicate very well because I get so bogged down in the weeds, which is what I'm doing right now. I can't remember the second or third, whichever the order is there, um, which if you could talk a bit about those, I think that would be great. But more so, my question that I wrote down here is when I'm conflicted, when I'm conflict, confronted with conflicting versions of those truths. So I find often when I'm reading scripture or arguing about politics or something else, the logic of the truth makes a lot of sense. But the wisdom of that truth doesn't seem practical. Or sometimes yeah. the wisdom does and the logic, you know what I mean? Yeah, and I may, I may tweak that a little bit because it's not just laws of logic, but that first one is really fact truths. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, I, I make the point that really the shorthand for me is what would be true if everyone were dead? So kind of the brute facts of the world. Um, and the, so that's kind of that first one, the fact truths. And then the second one is uh, meaning truths. And that's, that connectedness of what it means to be human. So when you connect those facts to humanity, uh, those create meaning. And so we have these meaning truths. And then we have wisdom truth, which is, is how we embody all the fact truths and meaning truths in our life and live out what it is that we think is, you know, we think about living out your truth. Um, that would be kind of this wisdom truth aspect of it, which is, is I would argue, different because fact truths and meaning truths can be cognitive, meaning they're in our minds, which plays really well in the West. In the West, we really like those. But mm -hmm. this wisdom truth is about embodiment. It's more physical. It's body. And it's living out kind of everyday ordinary life in, uh, in a way that we might consider it good. And so that's going to be a little bit different. And I, the book is really trying to emphasize that love if we understand it biblically, is in the category of this wisdom truth. Okay. So I was trying to talk to, so I, so as I've read this now, so it's been about a month since I finished it. Um, and I went back through and highlighted some more things tonight. Um, but I have been really struggling with trying to have conversations with people in such a way that I don't answer questions directly. 
uh, because you've got a great chapter in the back. I don't remember what chapter number it is where you're like, I'm just trying to be like Jesus, you know, just trying to, what'd you say? 198 questions, 138 questions, something like that. You know, you yeah. only answered three. Um, and I'm not really going to talk about divorce because I'm not qualified for that. And so I really, 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 really struggle with that. And so I find that I don't, I struggle to say anything to anybody. I just respond with memes. So for someone like me, where you're like, yeah, I'm trying to respond. I'm trying to speak truth and I'm trying to bring wisdom and I'm trying to be loving and I can't make those three reconcile. Like I, I just physically can't do it. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do we do this? How do I do this? Yeah, I think it's, again, for me, the title is important here because what I don't want is it to sound like I'm saying truth doesn't matter in the sense of facts that facts don't matter, especially in today's, you know, who would have known I would have really needed to emphasize this today. Like facts are important, everyone. Um, but what happens is when we get them out of order. So it's really, for me, a matter of priority. It's a matter of emphasis. And so, you know, there's this chapter I talk about the difference between the treasure map and the treasure itself. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I think what happens where for me, the wisdom I had to learn over the years was most of my life, I like to prioritize the map. I thought truth was kind of the goal. I thought that was kind of the, what we were shooting for. Like, I thought that was the goal of all of this is to get to the truth, get to reality. Mm -hmm. And what I realize is, as I've grown up, I realize that that doesn't lead to what my ultimate aim is, which is a better world, a better place, um, you know, a better, uh, more peaceful world for my kids to grow up in. Like that's ultimately what I'm shooting for and sitting around spouting facts or making sure everyone knows what the facts are hasn't led to that. And so yeah. it's really a reprioritizing where we put love as the emphasis and ask the question, what does it mean for love to matter more? How, how would that change this interaction if I was really most interested in love? Give me one second. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Come here. I can't hear you. You want to stay down here? That's not going to be a good idea. Go finish the movie. Then you can lay on the couch, but you have to be quiet or you're going to be in the podcast. Actually, you already are because I don't know how to edit video. <laughs> I have no idea how to edit video. Lay down. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. It's not great, but it is what it is. Yeah, when I have I don't have another parent to, to help corral the children. Um yeah, I think the chapter that you were talking about that with the treasure map, when I read that, I found myself so I put the book down and I set it aside and I was like, I do this often. Like, um, and you reference it, it made me think back to you're talking about Aaron and the melting down building a golden calf. Like everything that I thought was the point often is not the point. Right. And right about when I realized that the point is the point, the, the point seems to shift and change. Like something breaks open in me and I'm like, oh man, now that I got the point, now I have to do something else. Mm -hmm. and it never really stops, which is infuriating. Um, but I want to I wanna pivot back to something you said. To, actually, let me ask a question and then I'll pivot back. Um, so you talked about your love of Nicolas Cage movies mm -hmm. in that chapter there mm -hmm. on, on The Treasure Spoiler map. alert. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'm just curious what's what's the best one and what's the worst one? Because it's not a question I don't think anyone else is going to ask you. But now I'm now I'm curious. Yeah, you know, um, Raising Arizona. Is the best or the probably worst? Probably the best. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's like prime Nick Cage. And uh, what would be the worst? You know what I'm going to I you know what I'm going to say is I think the worst is probably the I think it's called the family man. But I actually secretly like it, so that's kind of the inside <laughs> scoop. But I think objectively, it's probably probably the worst. I, I don't know. I haven't seen every Nick Cage movie. I thought you were going to go with the Left Behind version because Oh, was, you know what? I totally awful. blocked that out of my mind. <laughs> yes, that's probably the worst. Like, it probably didn't even rank in my consciousness. Yeah. That's how bad it was. Yes, it was, yes, yes, yes. It was repressed. Uh, yeah. Just, just mm -hmm. say you didn't watch it and go with that. Um, at the very, very beginning, you were talking about truth. And then you said truth in its relation to the gospel. And then you pivoted away from that and said, I don't know that I really like putting those two together. What do you mean by that? I don't remember saying that. Oh, darn. Truth, the, truth is in its relationship to the gospel? Yeah, or the gospel truth or this truth. I forget exactly how you said it. I should have gone to it when you said it. It's not. If not, it's all right. I'll figure it out. Yeah, it's I don't okay. remember. It's okay. I've got it on the transcript twice. Um, it's all right. Um, the, all right, here we go. Let me pivot. My daughter's really bothering me. Being there. 
I totally get it. I totally get it. Stress stress me out. It stress me out. I, I like to be on this side of that because I've been in your shoes many a time. Have your kids interrupted the episodes before? No, but early, even earlier today, I was on a I was a guest on a podcast, and my son came in, and it's more stressful when it's someone else's podcast because I like don't want to mess up anybody else's podcast, <laughs> and so I'm like muting myself, and I'm I'm like not being completely nice. I'm like, you cannot be in here. Go away. And then I'm like, oh shoot, I hope my microphone is actually muted. <laughs> That's great. Um, okay, so no, uh, there is a part, I would like you to break a part of it just because most of the people I talk to, we pretty much always talk about the New Testament and, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and the Old Testament is your jam. Uh, specifically Jonah, and I do like how you work Jonah into this book as well a couple of times. I don't think you can not talk about Jonah. Is that, is that just your legitimate favorite book of the Bible? Yeah, oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, so you, there's a part in there where you talk about the desert and is it all right if I quote your book to sure, you? Sure. Yeah. 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 So you're in there and I believe you're talking about, yeah, you are talking about your children and you say, and there's a part in there where we, and by that you mean you and your wife um, won't say her name just in case we don't want to. That's where, that's where we realize that's where true life is found between the rules of slavery and the rules of the establishment between Egypt and Jerusalem. And then you go on to say, we found the God of Exodus, the one who is not tame, who does not provide purpose, but presence who doesn't promise abundance, but enough. And for us, the God was there. For us, that God was where we found freedom. And so in there, how does that relate to truth? Like the Exodus story, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think it's exactly what you said earlier, that every time I think I arrive at truth, it Mm. escapes me. And I think that's the nature of truth uh, for a human being is that it, it's always seeking but never finding. It's always just over the horizon. It's actually a pursuit and a process and not a destination. And I think that there is oppression and there's, there's often a, a pooling of power, if we will, when we stand still and think we've arrived. And this, is, I, this isn't original to me. This is something that I think is baked into the theology of uh, Brueggemann, who would have this idea in, I think the book uh, is called The Common Good, But that's where I kind of picked up on this, um, and I don't remember exactly what he says. I've probably taken it far afield from his original intentions. But for me, that's kind of the connection with truth is that, you know, there's this place of slavery um, where we use truth in that way. And then there's this place where we become the oppressors and we use truth to oppress others. So we're either being oppressed by truth or we oppress others with it. And both of those think of truth as a destination and not as this journey or this process that we can uh, that we can utilize in this higher goal of freedom or in this higher goal of love which I think those two are connected pretty heavily freedom and love yeah um, so can you rip apart a bit about the golden calf Aaron Moses up there on the mountain because the way that you describe it which I think I'll just go ahead and say what what my reading of that is um, so I'd always been the people needed a God. We have to worship something. So in the back of my mind, it was always preached to me like, you're wired to worship a God. Make sure it's the right one. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when I was reading your stuff, I was like, I never thought about it that way. Forced me to go back and read the Bible. So that's on you. I mean, you should be reading it anyway. But can you go, I mean, because you talk about it, you kind of bookend the book on both ends of it, or at least the front third and the back third. So can you go over that just a little bit? I will, and you can emphasize whatever points you want. I think the main thing that was the aha moment for me in that story was reading it closely in seminary and recognizing the nature of idolatry. And it was so profound for me. It changed how I thought of idolatry, and it made it so much more sinister and so much more uh, sneaky for me. And that is, if you read closely, Aaron does not actually prop up another god. Aaron creates a calf and calls that god Yahweh the God who brought you up out of Egypt. So it doesn't, it's not a different God. It's a tamed version of Yahweh. It's a God now that we can control. And in the background, the backdrop and context of the story, you have this incredibly uh, dangerous God up on the mountain, such that in the context of the Aaron story, everyone just assumes Moses is dead. Like, I mean, if you hear the rumblings of the deity and the lightning and the, the fear-inducing presence of this God, you're not thinking this is someone we can control. We think this is someone who is out of control. In fact, this God has chosen Moses and then has killed him after calling him up the mountain 
let's get something a little bit more under our control. And thus we have the golden calf, but it's not a different God. It is this God who brought you out of Egypt. And for me, what did, what that did for me is it helped me realize my most uh, self delusional idols are under the guise of Yahweh. They aren't this easy to spot movie, uh, you know, movie imitating the bad guys are really clean and clear. It's these things that we think are good and we convince ourselves are good. And we call these good things uh, the same. We call these sinister things like by the same name, but turns out that they are golden calves. Yeah. 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 So the part of that that emphasized me to drill it back. So I found myself trying to draw correlations to, because I, I will often say that people make an idol out of the Bible, which I, I think you would probably agree with as well. Yes. Um, but then that seems to me to be the easy picking. So I found myself struggling to find, personally, I think it's easier for me to figure out what I prop up as an idol and it, it can change day to day. Sometimes, honestly, the podcast is an idol, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Where it mm-hmm. becomes right. the thing that matters and it's important. Yep. And now that I've said that out loud, it's kind of a shame to say, but I'm going to leave it in the episode because it's honest. Um, but as a, as a, as a state, as a country, as Pennsylvania, what do you think are some of those things that the church has made an idol that maybe we should figure out how to let go of? Yeah, I mean, a lot of, I would tie it a lot to our Bibles, but within that we have certain uh, idiosyncratic or favorite interpretations that prop us up. Um, and so certainly nationalism and our adherence to the state, um, racism, white supremacy, mm. um, patriarchy. I mean, these would all be things that we have called good and called God and yet um, aren't. And, you know, for me, I mean, truth is absolute truth. The idea of absolute truth is one of those idols. Again, for me, the more sinister idols are all the good things that become the ultimate things. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think there can be an absolute truth or is the absolute truth just volitious love? And I'm not sure that I'm using volitious the right way there, like the act of constantly love. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it depends on how nerdy we want to get, but I think the idea of absolute truth I'm okay with, but I don't know what good it does us. Hmm. Because I don't think any humans have access to it. Hmm. All, and I, the way I say it in the book is only God knows it's an elephant, right? Hmm. So, yeah. so what, I mean, I guess if we're just for the sake of feeling warm and fuzzy, we can say there's an absolute truth. But I'm, I'm too much of a pragmatic. Like, I'm kind of like, okay, well, we did all this work. We staked our you know, flag on that hill. There's an absolute truth. Oh, but we don't have access to it. So what, what, what good did that do? Um, and so... Yeah, I, I would say that doesn't, it's not a question that's interesting to me anymore. Hmm. Hmm. Do you remember what it was that made you pivot to that? Because they're, you're right in the beginning that that's not always, that's not always the way you were wired. It's not, still not the way that I'm wired. Like I, I still mm-hmm. struggle with that. Like what was it for you that you're like, yeah, this is stupid. I don't even know why I'm doing this anymore. Like, do you remember that? That, that pursuit to absolute truth? Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe it academically, pastorally. Metal, yeah. I mean, I matter. think. Uh, I mean, to be honest, it probably was reading the work of Jacques Derrida, a um, postmodern philosopher who writes about the slipperiness of texts and the whole, there are holes in the texts. And he says really interesting and weird things like uh, it's text all the way down. And he says things like every act of justice is, is in itself an act of injustice. Um, and I, what he means by those things is every, there is no perfect act of justice. Every act of justice is also just a little bit injustice. And so the capital J justice, that thing that we're shooting for, we've actually never seen. And he would call that an impossibility, but it's an impossibility that makes everything else possible. Mm. So we're shooting for that capital J justice that we'll never get to but we have to hold it out because it is the thing that allows us to do those ambiguously just things. And I think mm-hmm. the same is true for truth. Yeah. You, so there's a part in there and you change the word and I wrote it down. So, you know, most people, when you say this already, you know, they'll speak the truth in love. So that I can now say or badger use Westboro Baptist as a, as an easy, um, right. 
I don't know what the word is there. Target. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was gonna say pinata. That works. Target's fine. Um, because it is an easy one. Honestly, I've used them in conversation as well. Like, um, I think it's I took it from Barbara Brown Terry. She's like, you know, you don't compare our best to their worst. Like, you don't right. compare. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, if you want to compare Westboro Baptist to ISIS, maybe. You know, but you don't compare the Pope to Westboro Baptist. That's a bad. Right. I'm screwing that whole analogy up. But you know, you're with me. Yep, yep. So, but there's a part in there you say that the difference is that you want to speak the truth. Where is it at? God, I lost it. Yeah. So speaking it by being in love. So how do you speak the truth by being in love? Like practically, what does that sound like? Specifically in a very local communal body, maybe even like a family, because I don't think with our closest family members, we usually speak that way. We speak most often in the most cutting way without any caveat of, I'm going to speak the truth in love. We just cut people. Yeah. I mean, again, this is a reorientation for me of how we approach our life. And so it's, you know, I have a chapter in the book that's all about practical tips, but one of the more profound tips for me, or at least the the practices that I've had, is reorienting every interaction around what do I want to get out of this? What, why am I having this conversation? And being extremely intentional for why I'm having the conversation. And for me, the reasons why I don't want to have a conversation anymore are so that I can convince someone that I'm right. So I can convince something, someone to change their mind so that I can feel good about my own moral or intellectual superiority. Like these were very personal and very vulnerable things that I had to recognize were the goals of almost all of my conversations that had to do with politics or religion. And so to, for love to matter more is to reorient and to say, these are such important matters, and I can't love this person well without knowing who they fully are. And so I want to go in being curious and interested in who you are. And for that, I need to know your opinion on these matters. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get to know you and to yeah. connect with you, not to convince you or to convince me. Yeah. There's, um, so you take, well, no, you use the model of Jesus uh, quoting, is it Hosea? Um, in Matthew about mm-hmm. fulfilling the law and the prophets, uh, right. the law, yeah. Um, and so, I find often when I try to preach love and I just lean on Jesus, people are like, "Yeah, but that's not what the Old Testament says. That's not what it means." You're you're making that scene something that doesn't need to see because they don't want it to be that way, or they think I'm trying to be too liberal with something or too mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. whatever with something. Um, how do we as Christians today? communally or individually reinterpret scripture through a lens of love in the environment that we're all in now where our community is actually limited like it's hard to go be with other christians in a safe Mm -hmm. way so i'm certain that that's not in the practical part because i don't remember it being there but what would you like like if someone called you to like jared i read the book i like this i i do have some thoughts about what paul says here or it's in timothy or this is here or this is in jude Mm -hmm. or i read this in ezekiel and I'm really struggling. How do you, how would you work that out? Like in, in trying to reimagine or reinterpret scripture? I mean, there's two practical things and I try to be as practical as I can. One is we recognize we all pick and choose parts of the Bible to apply more often than mm-hmm. other parts. Um, and so it's very easy to just pick the parts that lead us to love better. Um, and, we can still wrestle with the harder parts, but it's interesting to me, I guess for me, I've come to understand the scriptures because they're so diverse and ambiguous in themselves as sort of a Rorschach test, Rorschach test. And so it says a lot to me, which verses you're going to bring up and emphasize and which ones you're going to not talk about or not emphasize, because the reality is there's a lot of verses that are in tension with each other. So those people who say, yeah, but that's not what the Old Testament says, I would say, you're right. There are parts of the Old Testament that don't say that. There are parts of the Old Testament that rejoice and ask God to, you know, smash infant heads against rocks. So what are we going to do with that? Like, you know, so I think that's the first thing. And then two, there are really creative ways to reinterpret texts that are anchored in uh, the historical context of, of the Bible. And, um, you know, it takes a lot of work um, to be able to inter- reinterpret creatively while not losing that rootedness within our tradition. We don't get to just make it mean what we want it to mean, but there are many things it can mean. 
as our world and the biblical world collide. But we need to really be experts in our world and experts in the biblical world to do that surgery well. Yeah. Um, you quote, you talk a lot about wisdom. And if, if I can remember Pete's book, right, I feel like one of those quotes is from Pete's book, but maybe it's not. Um, I could just be misremembering, read too many books. Um, there's a good amount of sage advice, wisdom there that comes from a turtle or a tortoise, I think, isn't that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm curious in the, in the grand scheme of things, how much of your wisdom comes from external biblical sources and then of that percentage how much of that is is children movies that's it it is a high percentage of children's movies to be honest yeah (laughs) absolutely um for sure but i mean i think that's a really good question because maybe i'm outing myself maybe i'm I'm saying too much but (laughs) the the biblical text is old it's 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 disconnected from our world um, it is, I don't live 2,000 years ago. I don't live, you know, 2,500 years ago, 3,000 years ago in the case of the Hebrew Bible. So for it to mean something to me, there has to be these tentacles, these connections, these, this broader imaginative world. And that's what the world of fiction, the world of uh, Buddhist thinkers uh, like Pima Kudron and these like other folks that I read regularly they give voice to what I think are pretty biblical principles, but they have the luxury of living in the last few hundred years in a way that connects more with, with me. And so I think of it as all these other writers are scaffolds that keeps me connected to the biblical text in the same way that St. Augustine, St. Ignatius, St. Teresa of Avia, Richard Rohr, all these other writers are building on the shoulders of biblical truths and biblical principles and it's up to me now to collide those into my own life. Yeah. I'm trying to remember the name of that turtle. Ogie? What's his name? Ugwe. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. That is not one of my favorite movies. Mostly because I can't stand Jack Black's voice. Oh um, my gosh. His it's his voice. The character's hilarious. It's it's the it's the it's the voice. Um, I have actually turned on the Spanish version with English sub- subtitles. And I've enjoyed that a lot. It's, it's How did your kids like that? What they didn't watch it with me because it's a good So you, you watched the <laughs> Spanish version of Kung Fu Panda by yourself? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, with wow. English subtitles. Because it is a good I'm learning movie. a lot about you. I just don't like Jack. So the, I actually have subtitles on almost every show that I watch. I um, would if I could get away with it. My family is annoyed by it. but <laughs> I don't know why. It, for some reason, I retain what I'm watching better. Um, okay, so... I want to ask another practical question. So I get your book. I've been listening to the Bible for normal people. Um, I've been, you, know, you, you heard it here and you're like, all right, I do need to do this. And I like, there's a part where you talk about, you know, I'd like to in or interject a perhaps, um, which I have used quite often. It really helps at the bank. Honestly, it's helped a lot, especially in like coaching with my team mm-hmm. when they want to push back. And I'm like, perhaps we should try this. Tell me yep. how it goes. And mm-hmm. I find that it ends a conversation really well. They're like, yeah, okay, I could try that. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. But so I'm, I'm, I'm on a plane, I'm on a bus, I'm whatever, I'm at church and, and I'm sitting next to somebody that I just cannot reconcile things with. I don't, I don't like their politics. I don't like the way that they worship. I, I think that they're wrong. Don't even know why we go to the same church or why we go to the same school. And that could be about anything. It could be about mass. It could be about anything now. Um, and you want to try to begin practicing love. What's the first thing for someone that is just stepping out of a rigid version of speaking truth and love to going the other way like what's the first sentence or maybe the first way to approach that for someone that's tentatively stepping their toes in the water yeah i think for me curiosity is always my first step because i've I've found that curiosity and judgment make poor roommates so when i'm curious i tend not to be judgmental Whenever I'm interested, I tend not to be blaming. Um, And so having a genuine interest in human beings is a really good first step. So rather than coming to conclusions, asking questions, not even to the person, but to ourselves. I, I wonder why they hold that belief. I wonder what their parents believed. I wonder what church they go to. I, I wonder, um, you know, how do they, how does this belief system they have 
work out with their kids? How does it impact their parenting? Like, I can come up with probably 50 questions in the span of a few minutes that I'm genuinely curious about, regardless of what your ideology or political or religious beliefs are. And I just have an insatiable curiosity to understand. And I'm distracted by my curiosity long enough to let the emotions pass. And then I don't feel the need to kind of poke at someone yeah. um, or drive the point home. And the second thing I would say that's been haunting me, and I use that verb uh, on purpose, is this verse that Jesus uses in the Sermon on the Mount. And we usually focus on the Beatitudes, but there's this passage that has been rough for me. And it's Jesus saying, uh, be perfect like God is perfect. And how do, what does that mean? In this context, Jesus says, God sends rain on the just and the unjust, brings sunshine on the righteous and the unrighteous. And we should be like that too. And that's been a very haunting verse for me because I asked myself, if someone had a video camera and they were recording me during my days, would I be like God? Meaning you wouldn't know the difference between the people I disagree with or that rub me the wrong way or that annoy the crap out of me. And you wouldn't know those people from the people I love to spend time with, the love people like connect with the people that are like me. God is indiscriminate in how God behaves toward people. And that's tough because we can talk about like love your enemies. I think that's, that's great, but we can easily flip that into saying, yeah, I love my enemies. And the most loving thing I can do is tell them that they're full of crap because if I don't tell them that they're going to go to hell, right? So we can switch that. But in this passage in, in Matthew, it's very clear that God is indiscriminate in God's behavior toward in giving good gifts to the good and the bad. And can I replicate that behavior in my life? Hmm. So that's been a really practical thing for me as well. Hmm. I'm not successful at that. Yeah, me neither. At all. <laughs> Zero. Prob no, maybe 1% of the time. Um, accidentally, not intentionally. Yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, good. I want to ask you one final question. Um, it's something I've been asking everybody all year, uh, and you can answer it however you like, and I'm intentionally didn't tell you what the question is. So um, when you try to explain, so say my daughter who... I don't, she's probably asleep by now. Um, so say she walks up and she's like, Jared, my dad's full of crap. He talks a lot about God, but I don't know what God is. Like, how would you try to wrap words around explaining for you what God is? And it doesn't really matter that she's five. So I just use that as an, as an easy way to segue into the, to the question. Um, what words would you try to wrap around that? I don't, I really sincerely don't mean this to be a cop out. I think it does matter that she's five. And my, because my first question would always be to try to understand what they first think. How, what would you, just to be very honest, and this may not make for a good podcast interview here, but if someone came up to me and said, how would you define God? I would say, you know, I'm not, I don't know. How would you define God? And something that they say is going to lead me to another question. And that's going to lead me to another question. And at some point when they feel like they've gotten to a good place, I'm going to let it go. I'm going to say, yeah, that sounds good to me. <laughs> it's a fair answer. Um, and honestly, you are practicing the, what did, there's a part in here where you say, because I'm trying to be like God. So I'm just I'm gonna intentionally trying not, I forget where it is. I know where it is on the page, top third but line. I, and, I, and, right and, and, and to maybe answer the question in the way that you originally intended it, I think it's fair for me because it goes back to exactly what you said at the beginning. As soon as I figure out what God is like, God, uh, God maneuvers God's self out from under my thumb. Mm -hmm. So what is God like? I don't know. I mean, who knows? I, I thought I knew what God was like when I was 10 and 7 and 20 and, and 30. And, and God just keeps being different. So yeah. who yeah. knows? Yeah. Yeah, I once had a guest ask me, he's like, well, let me ask you. And the best I could come up with is, God, it's just a metaphor that I don't have words for mm -hmm. yet. Maybe one day, <laughs> just not today. Um, yeah, well, good. Well, I will, um, I, I want to thank you for your time tonight, Jared. Um, I think one of these days we'll have to do one of these in the day. Um, it, it would be great for all of us. Um, but where do people go? The, so the books everywhere that fine books are sold, um, 
probably try to order it from a local bookseller because that way everybody can make some money. Sure. But where would you want people to go to engage with you, engage with the book, pick up what you're putting down, all the things? Yeah. Well, in terms of the book, one thing I've been mentioning to people is we have a really cool uh, free gift for anybody who pre-orders it. I don't know when this will be coming out, but um, for lovemattersmorebook.com. And it's a three-part series on how to talk to people you disagree with. So it's actually about an hour's worth of content. It's three videos, each are about 15 minutes, where I talk about some of the principles, some of the practical tips, and we just go through kind of three parts of how to reorient these tough relationships. And it gets really practical. So I would encourage anyone to uh, pre-order the book and go to lovemattersmorebook.com and grab that. Um, you can also go there for a free chapter of the book if you aren't sure yet, if you want to pre-order the book. And then, of course, um, check us out on uh, thebibleforormalpeople.com. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you again for tonight, Jared. I always enjoy talking with you. It's a blast. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, good deal. I'll end that Zoom recording. <laughs>